Hey guys, not really sure what is gonna come of the weekly rant. I'm gonna still shoot videos. We're just gonna fire them out there whenever I feel like it. Today was the first day of the World Series of Poker. I did not fare too well, but I promise you, I brought it. It was A game, all A game. I didn't last past four level four. It's one of those 1500 no limits. You need to get really lucky. Um, I didn't, uh, but I thought I played really well. I actually tried in a 1500 no limit for the first time. And, I don't know, I usually don't play them anyways. So I was proud of myself. One thing I did find interesting though was I saw Ty Stewart dressed down, kind of scrubby, looking like a poker player. And you know why? Because he was a poker player for the day, coming in 19th place in the casino employees event. Now Ty Stewart, for those of you who don't know, has been behind some of the advances at the World Series of Poker. Um, one of the key guys there in terms of a vision for you know the November 9 and other things along those lines. So uh, he's a guy that definitely listens to the players. And, and I think him playing in this event just goes a long way towards creating a bond with the players. Because the truth is, unless you have been you know, in the grind at the World Series of Poker, you don't know. You don't know what the players want. You think you know. If you think you're better than us, Jeffrey Pollock, talking to you, you know, this is the thing I got beef with Jeffrey Pollock. He never played a hand of poker. He didn't want to know what a, if a flush beat his trade. He says, well, when I was at NASCAR, I didn't drive race cars. Like, it's different with us, bro. If you don't know our game, you don't, you don't know us, man. Good riddance. This is my hashtag on Twitter. Hashtag good riddance. Hashtag total phony. So good on Ty Stewart for finally getting his feet wet at the World Series of Poker and having a go at it. I want to do a quick wrap up on the fantasy draft that I held the $25,000 buy-in. I felt like my drafting strategy going in was really, really good. There was a few things that I think a lot of people uh, didn't realize. By average, the top player should have went for more because we had 15 entries the year before and only 11 this year. So essentially what that means is there's a whole bunch of players that will be available at the very end. So it's okay to blow your load on two guys you think are really good if you know that you're going to get some decent players near the end. So that's exactly what I did. I bid on myself at 83. I went for 89 the year before. I also took Eugene Kachilov, who I feel like is going to have an absolute monster year. He plays all the games really well, and he's also in the one drop. With my third choice, I decided to spend five bucks on Vanessa Selps. The reason I did that is aside from her being an absolute beast in No Limit Hold'em, she plays all the games now. She's really learning them. I don't know how good she is, but her approach to poker in general is very aggressive. So I feel like if she gets some chips in a game like Omaha 8 or better, she might just like bulldoze her way to a final table and maybe even win it. For a dollar, I also took a flyer on a rookie. Mr. Victor Blom. Um, I sort of threw him out there. I didn't necessarily want him, nope, but I was fine having him. Once I threw him out there, no one wanted to bite on a buck. They didn't really know if he's going to play a lot of tournaments, whether he plays a lot of the other games. I thought, you know what? Doesn't matter. The kid's so damn good. He's coming off two scoop wins. He won the $100,000 high roller uh, earlier in January. So uh, he's, he's starting to learn tournaments and starting to really enjoy them. So I thought for a buck, I'll take my chances. Also, if this guy has $1 million and $10,000 to his name, don't kid yourself, he will buy straight into the one drop. With my next pick, I took a guy based on a tweet, if you can believe it, Oiz Ahmed, after the ESPN Fantasy Draft, seemed pissed that he didn't get picked in the ESPN Draft, and he said he'd have more points than 75% of the players, and I do know that he plays all the games. He final tabled the $50,000 eight game last year. Seems like he's gung-ho, and with fire in his belly like that, by being snubbed, I thought, for three bucks, I'll take a mixed game guy for sure. Now my strategy really worked perfectly to get this next guy. I spent all my wad, really. I spent 83 on myself, 83 on Eugene, and you only have 200 to spend. So I've spent uh, almost, I've spent about 80% of my squad on two guys, right? So there's one more guy that I wanna get and I wanna see who like seeps through the cracks. So I was kinda waiting, I wasn't bidding on anybody, just waiting until everyone else started to go broke. All of a sudden, I had the most chips. So now, no matter what, I knew I can get Alexander Kostritsin. Here's the problem. <laughs> my partner in crime, Jennifer Harmon, sort of mentioned kind of like at the last minute after it was too late, um, yeah, you know, I think he just had a baby and uh, might not be coming. Thanks, Jen. I swear weddings and babies just completely ruin your draft. It's ridiculous. So the word is out on the Kostritsin pick. I mean, if the guy plays, he's obviously a monster. He went for 23 bucks. He'd been playing last year and this year, you know, he's, he's like a 60, $70 guy easy. So this could be a boomer bust pick. With my next pick for just $1, I picked a kid named Crazy Marco Johnson. A lot of you guys might not know who that is, but everyone in the know knows who he is. They know that he's been crushing the mixed games at both Bellagio and Aria for quite some time, and he is sort of a mixed game specialist. He plays all the games really well, and from what I heard, he's gonna play a lot of tournaments, so this could be an absolute steal at a buck. After I picked him, everyone went, wow, Marco was still available? That made me feel good about it. And then with my last pick, I mean, there were tons of guys that I still would've wanted. There was Chris Mormon available, Alan Cunningham available. Then I looked, wait a minute, really? Jonathan Duhamel for a dollar? <laughs> I'll take it. Okay, the guy's the world champ. He's like 24 years old. He's number one on all these lists. He's killing it this year. He's made 125 final tables since January, I think. And on top of that, Jonathan let me know that he's playing all the games. 
<laughs> little known secret, he's not just a no limit specialist. So I feel like an absolute steal getting a guy who's on fire, coming in with the right frame of mind. He's also in the one drop. So if you look at my team, you've got Eugene, who's in the one drop already. You got Jonathan Duhamel, who's in. Myself, you guys want to stake me? Because <laughs> I got to get in this thing. And then Victor Blom, like I said, you know, he's on the fence. I think if he has a million bucks, this guy's crazy enough to just fire it in there. For those of you in the full contact poker fantasy draft, there's a list of stats available now to see sort of like how your picks compare to others uh, in terms of like what percentage of people pick two. In the first group, which was Phil Ivey, myself, Elke, Jason Mercier, and Eugene Kachalov, Jason Mercier got the most votes, just edging out Phil Ivey. If you want to see the rest, you can uh, simply go to fullcontactpoker.com slash WSOP2012 slash stats, and you can see all the numbers there. So on the schedule tomorrow is a double dipper day, potentially. It's a $3,000 buy-in, half no limit hold'em, half pot limit Omaha. Heads up. It's a really unique event. See how that goes. I haven't played a lot of PLO heads up in a very long time, but when I did, I seemed to do pretty good at it. So we'll see how that goes. At 5 p.m., you've got the $1,500 stud eight. So if I don't do so well on the heads up, you'll see me jumping into the stud eight at 5 p.m. I'm going to keep these short and sweet and uh, try to, you know, do them a little more regularly. So peace out, peeps.